Professor Ed Hill, CBE. Welcome and uh, thank you for agreeing to spend uh, time reflecting on your highly decorated career in oceanography. Um, if you like, you can think of this as more of a kind of a wash up or a, a debrief of the last 40 years um, as a globally respected scientist and chief executive of the National Oceanography Centre. Um, and as I say, where better place to start than the beginning? And this could be our first exclusive of the interviews, but <laughs> you grew up in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and how did you end up in the UK? Well, it was uh, near Adelaide, actually, in, in South Australia. How, how do we end up in, in the UK? Well, my parents emigrated when I was a, a baby um, uh, to Australia, but uh, we, we came back um, when I was almost eight, eight years old. And uh, that's uh, um, actually my first experience of the sea. We lived uh, right by the, the coast in Australia. I used to see the, the, the liners coming out of uh, Adelaide past... Uh, our house we could see out of the window and uh, and and going wherever they did and when we returned to australia we came by ship uh, it was uh, f uh, four weeks uh, passage from adelaide to Fremantle, across to cape town uh, up to tenerife and 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 then to 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 britain uh, we left in october uh, which was uh, springtime in australia and uh, arrived uh, on the 4th of November. Um, and I uh, went up onto the deck of the ship uh, that morning and it was cold, wet, uh, um, drizzling, miserable. Um, and I could, there was a strange smell in the air, which uh, turned out to be coal smoke, which I'd never experienced. And I said to my father, Dad, uh, why have we come here? And um, and of course, uh, that was Southampton. Uh, we arrived at the port of South Southampton. So that was my exp first experience of Southampton, uh, which was, uh, Dad, why, close, why have we come here? Close to Knock. Um, it was uh, probably uh, uh, down um, towards, the, towards the Western Docks, you know, yeah. where the, where the uh, uh, not far from my, where Ikea is today, I think. Uh, and um, so um, little did I know then what a, a sort of important part in my life Southampton mm. much later on was, uh, would, would, would play. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Well, starting with early careers and, and young Ed, um, I'm going to have to hand you a few photographs as we go through this, um, this, this interview. Um, starting with his first uh, photograph here of a oh. very young... Yes, as a bearded one. Yeah, this was me at the age of uh, of twenty one. Um, I just uh, finished my uh, degree in applied mathematics at uh, University of of Sheffield, um, and uh, I'd been thinking about what to to do to do next. I I, I was looking for an academic uh, career, um, and uh, I had always been interested in the sea and. Um, I'd studied uh, fluid dynamics um, and thought that was interesting uh, I, and um, wanted to apply it in, in, in some way. And I thought about meteorology uh, uh, quite hard, but then, uh, then thought uh, uh, they've probably done it all already. So um, oceanography looks a bit more promising. And, uh, um, and so I went to Bangor to do a master's degree for, for one year. And the, the idea that that, that was a NERC-funded uh, master's programme, and it was idea was to be a conversion course from, mm -hmm. from mathematics or physics into, into oceanography. So it was quite, quite broad, broad ranging. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, so I went to do that, and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's only a year lost if I don't like it. And, uh, but, um, but I stayed, and uh, that was it. And actually, on my uh, uh, first day that I arrived, uh, uh, I was sent off uh, by the course director John John Simpson um, to uh, to go out to sea into the RSC for uh, uh, 24 hours to go and collect a mooring, and that was my first um, experience as an oceanographer uh, uh, at sea uh, in a small ship. And I wasn't quite seasick, but pretty close to it. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that was that was it. So you grew up in Coventry, is that correct? Yes, I was born in Coventry, and then uh, apart from those uh, early seven years in yeah. in Australia, uh, we then uh, came back, uh, firstly to Coventry, and then we moved to to the neighbouring town Rugby in in, in Warwickshire. Okay. So very much in the Midlands. So. Very much in the Midlands, as far from the sea as you could you could get. And actually, uh, that did have a big uh, effect on me. I I really did 
somehow there was something missing and and that was the sea which had always been been around uh, for all of my childhood as long as I could remember and um, so that that was really quite quite a wrench and I um, so uh, so that was that was it and in uh, you know my father was a, a sheet metal worker his grandfather my grandfather had been the same and um, prior to that, that uh, on my father's side, they'd all been uh, blacksmiths. My, my mother's from Northern Ireland, and uh, she came from a, a farming uh, family. Um, but people from my family uh, hadn't, hadn't been to university. Um, I went to a school uh, where very few uh, people went to, to university in, in those days, actually. Very few people went to university at all. Um, and so um, I was expected um, to go into the car industry and uh, I remember my grandmother uh, came to the house one day uh, having uh, obtained um, the paperwork to sign up uh, for an apprenticeship in the Jaguar car plant in, in Coventry and um, I just said no that's not what I want to do I, 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 I want to go to university and uh, there was uh, quite a row over it. I mean, this was a pretty big thing and a, a prestigious thing to have the opportunity to be uh, an apprentice in the uh, in the Jaguar car plant. But uh, but I said this this wasn't for me. No. Yeah. Um, I also understand that you were a, you have a natural talent for art. Yes, I was. I was always good at drawing and and painting. In fact, my father's. Uh, uh, quite a good painter, an amateur artist, but uh, we were brought up with him drawing and sketching and, and, and so forth, and I sort of followed in, in the footsteps. And I, I, I did art uh, A-level, uh, actually, and um, um, I was, people said that that's what I should do, that I had a, had a, had a talent for it, and actually my art teacher was very, very cross when uh, I said I was going to go do, uh, do mathematics at university, but I thought I'll... I'll never, I'll never make a living out of out of painting. Um, so, so I didn't do it, and um, and I really haven't done done much in the intervening years. It takes quite a lot of time, and I, I did actually find it quite frustrating. I was always uh, wanting to do better than I, than I was I was producing. But um, but yeah, that's probably where my more natural talent actually lay. Yeah. Um. So what captures about the ocean, you know, oceanography, you know, lots of tales around uh, love of the ocean. Do you have a, a similar? Yes, I mean, I think I've covered some of it in in the formative years of uh, being brought up so close to the sea in in, in Australia, um, and um, and then that that long sea voyage to to England. From Australia, I mean, I, I would sit on the deck and and just watch the sea and be fascinated by what was what was going on and um, re remarkable. But I had some um, the sort of things that attracted to me to you know was just the the, the vastness of this this vista out in in, in front of you. Um, but also, I from a very early age, I had had this idea of connectedness. Um, I could see these ships passing and they were going places far away, places that I'd heard about, England, um, but, and they were going there and it was the sea that was bringing, bringing them there. And I was always, um, when we came back to England and I very, very rarely would go to the sea, um, would think, you know, maybe some of this water uh, uh, had, had, had come from there. Of course, I now know that, uh, how, that, how that happens. But there is this, this sense of connectedness was, was quite strong in, 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 in my, my thinking about the sea from, from a very early age. So yeah. looking back at this, this path you've taken, um, is there any advice or one piece of advice that you would give a young Ed Hill? Well, I think the main piece of advice would be probably what I've actually done, which, which is um, take opportunities when they, they come along. Um, don't say no to things and, and take, take, some, take some risks. And I think I did take quite, quite a lot of risks in, in my, my career. Um, did the things that were not necessarily expected that I would do. Um, and um, I think I think I would recommend that to, to me again mm. and to anyone else that, you know, take a few risks, take a few chances, especially when you're young. Um, and, um, and 
don't always do what's expected of you. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Ed, was there, you know, not having anybody in your family from the oceanography field, um, did you have any sort of support or influential figure in your life that sort of guided you or influenced you to, to pursue this, this uh, industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a good question. Um, uh, I think, actually, in terms of ocean, I, 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 I didn't have that many people uh, around, and that's why it, it, it came later. But there was a, a, an important, uh, I, I, you know, I, I very much enjoyed school as a, as a, as a, as a young child, and um, there were several teachers. And one in particular, um, who was actually, uh, when I uh, went to secondary school in the first year, and she was um, uh, uh, an old lady, she was 75 at the time, teaching um, and uh, she taught everything maths English and uh, uh, and so forth um, uh, she was from the from the old school she had a she had a cane at the ready <laughs> those were around in those days um, but um, she actually you know I, I, I lost a lot of confidence I think uh, uh, at that stage and um, uh, she really made me believe that I, I had ability and um, and sort of convinced me of that and gave me a lot of a, a lot of a lot of confidence yeah. and so so she probably really set me on the on on the right course of um, taking education seriously I'd, I'd probably been uh, playing around yeah. quite quite a bit before then yeah, yeah. so um, so 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 that that was it um, and then yeah, there have been many other people uh, mm. al along along the way. He, so he really motivated me. Way, but he knows that was the uh, that, that was the uh, keep me on the straight and narrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think's been the most significant change that you've experienced? Well, in terms of uh, ocean science, I mean, I think you you would probably have to say um, the the ability to measure the ocean. You know, the technological revolution that has really transformed our ability to uh, observe, monitor and undertake science in the ocean really, really has been transformational. You know, even when I started out in my um, master's degree, it, it was, um, you know, equipment was unreliable, you know, and, you know, we took uh, some of the first uh, computers to see to to log data and, and and things like that i mean all of that is has completely transformed um which it now makes it possible to uh make the the observations and the measurements that we do at scale in a truly sort of global way so that that's a technological transformation but there's also been and perhaps even more importantly you know um people have stayed the same uh that that you know level of enthusiasm i've always been surrounded by people who are absolutely passionate about what they do as, as scientists and and that's sort of a, a constant but I, I sometimes say that you know I, I i sort of came into oceanography i talked about my love of the sea but I, you know i was interested in fluid dynamics and and so forth but i talked to an increasing number of young young people who's who really coming into ocean science because they want to save the save the planet, mm. and um, that kind of wasn't part of my thinking and probably wasn't part of my generation's thinking at the at the time. Um, but that's a new dimension that's come in, and I think that's that's a that's a that's a different motivation, and it's a it's a very positive and healthy ones. Yeah. There are some perhaps downsides because I think scientists also need to. Uh, understand the boundary between activism and doing 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 science in terms of maintaining the integrity of the science and not having it too politicized and, and so forth but those, that's a sort of a separate set of issues but I think the, the motivations and the ambitions of uh, younger people coming into oceanography I, I find them altogether more fulfilling and uh, and 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 uh, yeah just yeah. I, I find it fascinating I guess you're seeing a much more um diverse group of people coming through as well. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. There are many more uh, uh, women in, mm. in oceanography. Um, that's not to say that when I was training, was a PhD, that there were some uh, 
women scientists, some of some of whom have uh, become very uh, eminent leaders in their in their own in their own right and are well known today. Um, so, um, but I think that's. Uh, but they they were very much in a minority, um, whereas today that is that that balance is changing changing a lot. And I've always appreciated the diversity in a more in a more general sense in 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 oceanography that people across the world all engaged in this endeavour, um, which requires not only scientists but engineers and sailors and. And, and everyone, um, I think oceanographers kind of know more instinctively than, than others that um, advancing our field of science isn't all about uh, the sometimes so-called low genius model of science, <laughs> that it, it, it really is a team uh, enterprise um, and it involves all of the other people that you need to make it possible to get to see and do the do the work that, yeah, that you need. I've, I've heard people talk about collaboration and the importance of collaboration many times. Yeah, I I'm I I uh, I'm a, a great believer in, in that. You know, the ocean is too big uh, for anyone to think that they can they can do it alone. Any one country, let alone any one institution. So collaboration is is absolutely absolutely essential to doing it. And um, and we might return to this subject. But I have an immense appreciation for the the unsung heroes that actually make a lot of it work behind the scenes. Some of the often unglamorous uh, aspects that actually makes collaborative international science work. Um, it, they they're all a really important part of this enterprise. And you take them out, and then you see, you, you find you wouldn't be able to do this. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, time for another photo. Uh, I'm going to pass you this one. Maybe tell us uh, what's going on here and uh, if there's a story to that one. Yes. So this is uh, uh, me. We're, of course, Rowley Rogers is here at the National Oceanography Centre. But the lady in the, in the photograph um, was a, a senior civil servant in um, the Department for um, Business uh, called Claire Durkin, who I spent quite a bit of uh, time working uh, with as a result of um, an interaction that I had when the uh, Royal Research Ship Discovery uh, came into London. I think it was in, in 2016. And um, the then uh, science minister um, had been to a G7 science ministers meeting in Germany where Germany had put ocean on the on the agenda and they were talking about you know, deep sea minerals and plastics and uh, someone had put the science minister up to the idea of uh, but there needed to be something bigger and more ambitious than this and he'd come up with this phrase um, I don't think anybody from here had fed it to him but somewhere he'd got it that what we really needed was something big like a CERN of the ocean uh, CERN being the big uh, particle accelerator in uh, in Switzerland and he uh, I was talking to him on the bridge of discovery and he, he said that he'd had this idea uh, that we needed a CERN of the ocean and um, and he wanted it to be in Britain and um, so I said to him well I think I can explain to you what a CERN of the ocean means and I described um, what we know as the global ocean observing system the big infrastructure of collaborative continuous observing of, of the ocean for climate and hazards and, and, and so forth. And I took him onto the deck of discovery and showed him some of the autonomous vehicles that would um, contribute to the uh, to, to such a system and how this was a like CERN, big, um, it was collaborative, it was international. Um, but unfortunately, by its very nature of being globally distributed, it couldn't be in Britain. Um, but there were uh, parts of this system that uh, Britain could lead and, and, and was leading. And um, uh, so he, he, he took that, we, we wrote that up and, and put it to him. And uh, that's how the G7 Future of the Seas and Oceans initiative, which was led by the UK and still is, yeah. it's still one of the rare G7 programs that uh, survives more than um, a couple of meetings um, 
and it's part, only part, but mm. part of the of the story of trying to build this uh, global infrastructure for sustained uh, ocean ocean observations. And uh, uh, Claire was the, uh, the uh, civil servant who was uh, leading on that for him, and uh, and that's her on a visit to, yeah. visit to Knock. As a physical oceanographer, um, you spent part of your life on board research ships. Is there a re uh, region that um, you would have loved to have studied, but for one reason or another didn't quite get there? Well, um, I spent a lot of time on, on research ships. I think I did over 20 expeditions, and about half of them as the chief, chief scientist. Um, uh, not unfortunately, ships like the ones we have today. These were uh, most of my research was in uh, shallow uh, continental shelf seas, less than two hundred meters uh, deep, um, and so they were they were shorter expeditions, um, and they were in altogether smaller smaller ships. Um, and I did a lot of that around uh, around the UK waters in the North Sea, where a lot of time west of Scotland and west of Ireland. Um, working on those, although I, I did do some deep sea uh, expeditions, and most notably uh, one in the Indian Ocean on what was then the Royal Research Ship uh, Charles Charles Darwin, um, where I'd proposed um, a little bit of opportunistic science off the back of uh, the ship being there, which was to measure the deep um, flow of Antarctic bottom water uh, from the uh, Masserine Basin into the Somali Basin through the Amaranti Trench, which we we did. It was the first first measurements of that 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 flow. So um, so I so I did that. Um, in terms of uh, 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 regions, I mean uh, clearly the the parts of the of the ocean that are are dramatically changing the Arctic and the, and the southern Southern Ocean. I think the Arctic is is an area that that uh, that that perhaps would have would have interested me, um, um, uh, and some of the uh, the, the areas of the uh, you know grossly undersampled ocean in the South Pacific, for example, um, some of the more e exotic places. Um, but I did uh, enjoy uh, uh, continental shelf oceanography. It's hugely Im Im important. Um, the continental shelves are only about you know twelve percent of the surface area of the of the of the ocean, but uh, uh, most of the ocean's uh, production and fisheries and so forth is in those kinds of kinds of waters, and it's of course where human beings and uh, and the and the, the sea interact uh, most intimately in in in, in the continental shelf. So I was I was very happy working in 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 those areas, but. Um, um, so, so yes, yeah. I think those are the those are the kinds of things. So you've experienced much sea sickness. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I was uh, I was uh, uh, susceptible to sea sickness. It would take me about two or three days to get my sea legs, and then I'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I I did uh, I did uh, suffer from it, and um, I uh, uh, used to uh, occasionally think when you'd be. Uh, you know, working the 12 to 8 watch in the middle of the night and humping great big bits of kit around in the wet and drenched and feeling sick. Um, I, I remember saying to myself, I must really love this because <laughs> I just keep coming back for more. So, uh, so, so yeah. yeah. So you, you've also, you know, travelled uh, all over the world banging the drum for the ocean. Um, is there one significant conference or breakthrough in research or technology that you consider to be the, you know, a real game changer for ocean or climate? Yeah, I, I tend not to think in terms of breakthrough moments or conf you know, uh, conferences that have changed the world, because science um, kind of doesn't work like that. It's, it's often uh, built on a progression you know, incrementally. That's not to say the science in incremental, but even the breakthrough, game-changing uh, events are, are all built on that slow, slow progression. So I rate those as, as much as, as any, anything. In terms of a, a conference, um, the, the one that uh, really stuck in my mind was COP27. 
which was in Sharm el-Sheikh in, in Egypt for a number of reasons, and not necessarily because of any particular breakthrough there, but, uh, but how symbolic it was, both for Nock as an institution, uh, but also for, for, uh, for, the, for the ocean realm. What happened there was that um, we, uh, as an institution, were uh, non-governmental accredited observers. Um, but I'd been approached at the United Nations Ocean Conference just a few months before about whether we would be willing to join into putting together an ocean pavilion, which would be the first time uh, ever at a climate conference that the ocean people were going to be there in force in the blue zone, uh, the diplomatic uh, zone. Um, and uh, without hesitation, I said yes. I did want to know how much it was going to cost, but uh, I, I was uh, right there in principle because um, that was the first time that ever happened. It became a real hub for uh, ocean people to gather, but it became a real sort of a spotlight point of visibility uh, for the ocean. A lot of um, uh, ministers, heads of government, even and negotiators came, and it, it was it was kind of like the ocean had arrived mm. uh, at COP. Now that's not to say that there hadn't been uh, people working away at this for some time. Um, you know, Carol Turley at the Plymouth Marine Lab, for example, had done a, a sterling job in bringing ocean acidification onto the agenda uh, as a really important ocean dimension to the climate change, but. She and a few other uh, heroes like that had really been rather lone voices. And, um, but then the IPCC uh, did its special report on the oceans and cryosphere, which really started to put the, the spotlight on the ocean. And then it, you know, there's still a long way to go. Um, but it was, it was getting into the, into the climate agenda that really the ocean has got more than something to do with, with, with climate change. And um, so I thought that that moment at COP27 when the, the, the ocean community came together in a, in a pavilion and you know we didn't all have our own logos on it. It was the ocean pavilion. We all set aside our uh, you know, in, institutional vested interests and flag waving uh, in, in, in a common cause and uh, to, to raise, raise a bill of visibility. And that's really the beginning of a long process yet to come. But for me, that was, it's the symbolism of that, that, that moment that, that really mattered. Yeah. yeah, one voice for the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so if, if um, that was the game changer, in certain words, um, what's the one thing that really needs to happen for oceanography? So let's put it another way. Um, if you were granted one wish for the ocean of ocean science, what would that be? Yeah, uh, in terms of a wish for the ocean, it's that um, people form a different relationship with it, a more respectful one. You know, we in in the sense that you know the ocean is hugely but invisibly uh, important to our everyday lives in in all manner of things, and I won't you know go through all of the statistics that can evidence evidence that. Um, but in terms of science, um, the, the key thing, I think, is um, to recognise that the big problems relate to scale. And a lot of that is what is happening at global and uh, whole basin scale, um, for which the key scientific methodology is going to be continuous, globally distributed, sustained observation to build the picture of what is happening and to provide the evidence to inform uh, decision making. And I've, I've talked about the Global Ocean Observing System and I, I keep coming back to if one is serious about the ocean then one has to do science and do the observations at scale um, in space and in, and in time. Um, and so that's really what has, what has got to happen and I just don't think the system, whether that be the political system, but also the, the, the scientific funding system is su su sufficiently attuned to what we need to do here, that ocean science really is transforming into, into big science and uh, needs to be thought about in different ways and funded properly and in, 
and in different ways to to match the shift in importance and the, the, the scale that's needed. The other thing is, and I'm a physical oceanographer, um, but it's been clear for some time that the real important issues are increasingly in the biogeochemical and uh, and the, the ecological sphere in, in, in the ocean. And I've always said, you know, biogeochemistry is kind of almost the center of gravity of, of ocean science. That's not to um, disparage other, other areas, but you can see that those are where the really big questions are about how that, that the system works. I mean, if you just take a really interesting sort of statistic, if you, if you, you know, add up the, uh, how many tons of carbon uh, atoms, you know, we've got in the, in the biosphere on earth and there's, uh, in, you know, round numbers about 450 billion tons of, 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 of biomass measured by carbon, um, on the land, mostly, you know, trees and things like that. And it, it comes as a surprise to many when you ask, you know, so what's the equivalent uh, tonnage in, in the ocean, which is vast? And, and the answer is about somewhere between three and six billion tons. In other words, it's tiny. So one conclusion, well, well, let's forget about the ocean. The amount of life in there is, is minuscule compared with, you know, in terms of tons of carbon and what's in the terrestrial biosphere. But it's a completely wrong answer, for, firstly, the, the very high biodiversity within that six billion tons. But that six billion tons is doing a lot of hard work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> half the oxygen we breathe, absorbing 25% of the carbon dioxide, because it's, it's rapidly turning over. Um, and, and the way in which that ecosystem functions is hugely, critically dependent on all of the physical processes going on in the ocean, the mixing, the circulation, then the chemistry and, and, and so forth. Um, so this is, a, this is a hugely important part of the life support system of the earth being uh, driven by a, 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 a tiny fraction of, of, the, of the biosphere in terms of biomass. And um, so if you were to uh, ask yourself which which bit of the Earth's biosphere you, would you be most worried about falling over? Then I'd be pointing at the ocean, saying, you know, we've really got to understand what's going on here, and this is where we've got to, got to protect things. So those, those seem to be the, 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 the big issues, and that's why we need to bring all of the science, including the physics that uh, controls a lot of this system, to, 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 to bring to bear, because, um, you know, the, the big the big challenges that we, we we face in the ocean relate to its its biosphere, and it would be wrong to say that uh, changes in the physical climate are reversible. They 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 they're not. But in a way, um, it's a much easier problem to deal with and a more tractable problem um, to deal with the heating of the planet than to do with the degradation or the um, uh, the complete loss of of, uh, of, of biota uh, that is, you know, a fundamentally game-changing, uh, irreversible um, process that is is going on, and that's uh, that's why we really need to take this this seriously. And the science and the measurements, and why the global observing system has got to move beyond measuring the physical climate system to really get a handle on what's going on with the with, with the biosphere because it's as I've said it's it's the Earth's life support system. Can I slightly change the tack now. Um, and you know looking back to your early years. Um, so you took over the reins of Proudman um, Oceanography Oceanographic uh, Laboratory at the age of tender age of thirty nine. Um, and you took over the reins at NOC as uh, CEO at forty five. What does that feel like? Well, um, if I just start with uh, the, the Proudman Lab when I was uh, I, I was much younger, I, I had I had come to the conclusion. That, I mean, I was still active in research and publishing, and uh, but I, I felt that I wanted to do more and that I could contribute more. I never rated myself as you know one of the world's leading scientists. I, you know, good at what I did but I, I but I did feel that I had talents um, beyond 
actively doing research myself. And there was uh, several things that sort of convinced me of that. One of which was I was given the uh, task at Bangor of um, looking to see whether it was possible to replace the research vessel, the, the Prince Maddox, which was definitely uh, beyond its end of life. And um, it had been talked about for a decade as whether it's possible to replace this. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, I think. And But I made the case for why we should should replace it rather than some other options that were on, on offer at the time, such as hiring vessels or getting time on uh, vessels and so forth. And uh, was successful in um, getting a joint infrastructure fund bid together. Um, to build a new uh, research vessel, which included a, a quarter of the funding was going to come from the private sector uh, as well. So that, that was in uh, 98, 99. It was funded in, in 99. And I got a real buzz out of that because I thought, wow, this ship, you know, is going to, um, its next 25, 30 years, is going to do a lot more science and enable a lot more people than I'm ever going to be able to do it on my own. And I thought, you know, this is what I... This is what I want to I want to do, and um, and I was quite good at organising things, and I had a sort of a clear v vision that we needed to somehow organise oceanography in the UK better than it than it was organised, and then uh, something happened to me that um, I um, I was diagnosed with a with a medical condition which basically meant that I couldn't go to sea anymore. Um, they wouldn't give me an ENG1 medical certificate. I've never told this to anyone before. And um, and I thought, well, I don't really want to be an oceanographer if I can't go to sea. Yet. And what, what am I going to do? And um, but I thought this this enabling role and actually getting a getting a new ship, but which I knew that I would never be able to sail on. I, I could see how I could, I could work this and leading in, in enabling science. And so I won't say it was the only thing, but it was a pivotal moment that, uh, I, that I, I knew I wouldn't be able to go to sea again. And um, I think sometimes people have wondered why I haven't been out on the Discovery or the, or the Cook. And uh, as many other directors do go out and um, it's not because I'm not interested. I, I just couldn't do it. So, um, so let me know. Yeah. <laughs>